Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute. Hello, and welcome to episode 289 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present-day world we live in. And I'm your host, Liz Covart. The name Great Dismal Swamp doesn't exactly evoke an image of a pleasant or beautiful place, does it? And yet, it was an important place that offered land speculators the chance to profit and enslaved men and women a chance for freedom in colonial British America and the early United States. Marcus Nevius, an assistant professor of history at the University of Rhode Island and author of City of Refuge, Slavery and Petite Marinage in the Great Dismal Swamp, 1763 to 1856, has offered to guide us into and through the Great Dismal Swamp and its history so that we can better understand Maroons and Maroon communities in early America and learn more about how enslaved people used an environment around them to resist their enslaved condition. Now, during our journey through the swamp, Marcus reveals information about the Great Dismal Swamp and how it came by its dismal name details about maroons, and the differences between petite marinage and grand marinage, and the many roles the Great Dismal Swamp played in enslaved people's resistance to slavery. But first, I have a programming note. Next month marks the 400th anniversary of the Mayflower's arrival in present-day Plymouth Harbor. Thanks to the generous support of Mass Humanities, the Omohundro Institute and I have been working on a two-episode series that explores Massachusetts 400 years ago. This series will post on back-to-back Tuesdays on December 8 and December 15, 2020. This means you get to enjoy the series over consecutive Tuesdays, and the digital audio team and I can enjoy a two-week break to spend the holidays with our families. So in December, our episodes will post on December 8 and December 15, 2020, and Ben Franklin's World will come back with brand new episodes just after the new year on January 5, 2021. Okay. Are you ready to venture into the Great Dismal Swamp and its history? Let's go meet our expert guide. Joining us, we have an assistant professor of history at the University of Rhode Island. His research interests focus on slave resistance, slavery based economies, and abolition during the Age of Revolutions. He's published several book reviews, an article, and a book, City of Refuge, Slavery and Petite Marinage in the Great Dismal Swamp, 1763 to 1856. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Marcus Nevius. Thank you for having me, Liz. It's a pleasure to be here. Marcus, given that so much of our conversation today will be centered on the Great Dismal Swamp, or perhaps in the Great Dismal Swamp, would you tell us about the swamp and... Why it's such a dismal place? Sure, sure. The uh, Great Dismal Swamp is today a federally protected reserve in its major portion and a state protected preserve in a smaller acreage that straddles the border of North Carolina and Virginia toward the southeastern side of the state of Virginia. Most of the swamp is north of the North Carolina line. It's been there for millennia. In the Revolutionary Era and in the early Republican period, covered about 2,000 square miles, located about 10 miles or so to the south of the center of Norfolk, roughly about the same mileage or so to the northeast of Edenton, North Carolina. So it essentially stretches from just south of the southern shore of the Chesapeake Bay to just about north of the northern shore of Albemarle Sound in North Carolina. It has a long history of being an environment that was very, very difficult for human beings to cross in its Native American history and in its colonial history as well. And the name Dismal, for what it's worth, can be traced to a number of early 18th century travelers and land surveyors who all viewed in its thick vegetation and its difficult to cross peat soils, a very dismal place that just did not react well to human efforts to change its landscape. And so instead of seeing it for the environmental, beautiful place that it is, it was called, in many instances, dismal, foreboding, 
ignoring, of course, its environmental beauty. So I take it that it was the dense vegetation and these very peaty soils that really made the swamp so difficult to cross. Yes, in a nutshell, then and now, as uh, personal experience in 2013 taught me. So the swamp itself is comprised mainly of local tree species, much less so today in terms of white cypress, much more in the past, and a variety of species of southeastern pine, and then other tree species as well, and dense underbrush, which anyone who's from southeastern Virginia or northeastern North Carolina will know all too well in trying to keep their backyards tame. But because the Dismal Swamp itself is sort of this contained landscape or this difficult to tame landscape, it has annual cycles of vigorous, verdant, lush greenery. And then in the late fall and winter months, cycles of death in this greenery that essentially comprises leaf litter, which over time degrades and becomes the peat soils of the swamp. And when you add to that, that it's essentially a tidal basin that due to 20th century geographic changes has been more and more cut off from its normal tides of ebb and flow along with the Atlantic Ocean. It's a different landscape today, but before the Civil War, it was a landscape that was very much susceptible to heavy spring and summer rains, flooding to the point where a human being might try to cross its geography and find themselves very quickly mired in very wet, dense peat soils, or find themselves having to ford different parts of the swamp that were inundated in any given season. So you've now described a place that has a lot of water at many times of the year and was also very muddy most of the year. Now, Shari wonders what inspired you to study the Great Dismal Swamp and how you went about researching the history of a place and its environment. I sort of backed into the Great Dismal Swamp, honestly. (laughs) I was very much interested in Black resistance as an undergraduate at North Carolina Central University, an historically Black university located in Durham, North Carolina. And in my studies of Black resistance, I became very much interested in enslaved people's activities in running away, seeking freedom, or seeking to reclaim ownership of their bodies and their person. And it so happened in my studies of this subject of slave flight and the subject of Black resistance that the person who I first began serious study of these subjects with, Dr. Freddie Parker, who is now Professor Emeritus of the Department of History there, he was a scholar of slave flight in eastern North Carolina in the late revolutionary period and throughout the early antebellum period. And so... I began my studies really with his suggestions and with his two contributions to the subject, a small book called Running for Freedom and a much larger collection of the several hundred runaway advertisements he had compiled for the slimmer volume called Stealing a Little Freedom, both of which were published in the mid-1990s by Garland Publishing. And in studying Dr. Parker's work and in thinking about ways that I might contribute further to the work that he had laid, I began tracking the ways in which the enslavers or advertisers for enslavers began describing the motions, the activities of enslaved people who they publicly advertised for. One of the refrains that really drew my interest was lurking about the neighborhood. And I discussed this, of course, in City of Refuge, but runaway advertisements for all that they do not include that offer us a rich understanding of who enslaved freedom seekers were. They do tell us a lot about, in many cases, where advertisers suspected enslaved people were trying to get to, for example, to another plantation to go visit family or to visit a wife or a husband or whatever have you, or trying to escape a colony or a state by way of securing passage of a vessel along the coast, or lurking about the neighborhood, which essentially meant slipping away into local woodlands, local swamplands, local mountainous regions to hide out indefinitely. And it was in taking this up in my master thesis that I began to really consider that there might be a deeper story here. And in my conversations with Dr. Parker, to that effect, he suggested that I take a look at the Great Dismal Swamp, its history and its more recent scholarship, which at that time, the late 2000 aughts, mainly comprised the efforts of the historical archaeologist Dan Sayers, who had been digging (laughs) about the Dismal Swamp for that decade, attempting to recover 
the archaeological record of the swamp and attempting to understand better its historical records as well. I know we want to dig into the archaeology here, but first, could you describe an advertisement for runaway enslaved persons so that we can get a better understanding of the information that was contained in those ads or perhaps not contained in those ads? Absolutely. So tracing to about the mid-18th century generally, and certainly expanding with the expansion of the printing press throughout the late 18th century and definitely into the 19th century. Runaway slave advertisements were generally small ads that were included in all manner of local papers, which sought essentially to capture key information that an enslaver or an advertiser on an enslaver's behalf might include to inform the public to be on the lookout for someone who was on the run. Generally, this information included the name of the enslaved person who was on the run, if that enslaved person carried a name, physical descriptors, including general description of height, general description of weight, general description of skin tone, general description, too, of distinctive marks, which sometimes included country marks or marks that were cultural indicators of an African heritage, other times marks that were clearly evidence of injury within an enslaved context. So for example, a missing finger or a limp of some sort or scars that would be clearly recognizable were someone, a person in the general public, but also a sheriff's officer or a slave hunter might encounter this person and be able to clearly identify this person. They never or rarely, I should say, do they go more than about 10 lines or so, maybe 150 words. And to boot, they always included information about a potential monetary reward or some other form of reward were someone to capture an advertised enslaved person and return them to the advertiser. And they also included the name of the advertiser or the name of the enslaver and the date. One more important note, is that generally they would run for several months at a time. And so you could often see the initial date that a slave runaway advertisement was published by the paper. And then you might find the same advertisement or a very similar one several months down the line if an enslaved person was still on the run several months down the line. Do we know if these runaway advertisements were successful in terms of their helping enslavers find their runaway slaves? We know generally that for enslaved people who remained near the place they sought to escape, or for enslaved people who attempted to go to a known place like a plantation or to ports to secure passage on a vessel, that in those cases, runaway advertisements were somewhat effective, particularly if they were circulating amongst a population of people who had a slightly higher level of literacy. And what I mean by that is that they're circulating in a place like Norfolk, where either they're coming into the hands of someone who actually can read them, or they're circulating in local taverns where they can be dictated to people in those places. But by contrast, in places such as the Great Dismal Swamp region, it's much more difficult to gauge just how effective these slave runaway advertisements might have been for reasons that seem relatively obvious as I think about them, but that an enslaved person might escape to a landscape like the Great Dismal Swamp or to another difficult to access landscape. In those cases, it was much more difficult. But do we have general specs? Not good ones that are recent. We have what scholars attempted to contextualize in the late 1980s and early 1990s. Earlier, you mentioned an archaeologist named Daniel Sayers who conducted archaeological digs in the Great Dismal Swamp. And Griffin is curious about the archaeological finds that Sayers made. So, Marcus, would you tell us about the archaeology of the swamp and what the archaeological evidence can tell us about the people who made their homes in the swamp? Let me first begin with a disclaimer. I am no archaeologist. Although I did have the privilege in 2013 spending a month with Dan Sayers and his last undergraduate field school out of American University in the Great Dismal Swamp, essentially gathering a crash course of the swamp's archaeology as told by Dan Sayers himself and the graduate students with whom he was working. 
what I learned in that experience was that much of the archaeology of the Dismal Swamp is lost to the swamp's ecology, essentially. The peaty soils are highly acidic, and the waters within the interior of the swamp are also highly acidic. And so much of the material culture which one might expect to find in the Dismal Swamp, for example, clothing items or items that might biodegrade, they're just not there. What does remain in the swamp, however, is a significant record of lithic artifacts. On the one hand, lithic artifacts being stone, which essentially had to be transported into the swamp because there's not much naturally occurring stone within the swamp's environment, and evidence of fire in the form of naturally occurring fires, which often happen in the spring and summer months in some sectors of the swamp, and in other sectors of the swamp that don't burn as often, human campsites or human small pits where fires were kept. To the lithic evidence, there's much evidence that the earliest archaeology of the lithic evidence traces to Native American activity in the swamp. Hammer stones, for example, or other forms of stone tools that are clearly traceable to pre contact Native American activity or early contact Native American activity, tracing up to about the 17th century or so. And then there's a great deal of evidence of some of these stone tools being reworked in the swamp. And here I'm paraphrasing to the best of my ability Dan Sayers' work, as I do in City of Refuge where it's clear that the sherds or the very small slivers of stone are evidence of someone in the swamp reworking a stone tool at a certain site and cracking pieces of the stone that remain in the archaeological sites on a particular hummock within the swamp. To the evidence of fire, there's two contexts for that evidence. There's the one context which is clearly associated with slave labor camps at certain sectors of the swamp at different time periods, where enslaved people at any of these particular slave labor camps would have been within the swamp, having been dispatched to a certain site, but for months at a time, and where they're maintaining fires, particularly at night for heat, and also to ward off some of the larger mammals who might try to eat them. And during daytime, maintaining fires at these slave labor camps to ward off the massive clouds of mosquitoes and yellow flies and other insects which love to bite human beings and other mammals in the swamp. In the other context, remote from slave labor camps are sites where Dan Sayers and other archaeologists believe that Maroons would have maintained camps and, of course, for the same reasons, maintain small fire pits as well. Now, in City of Refuge, Marcus's book, Marcus tells us much about the many peoples and businesses that made use of the Great Dismal Swamp between 1763 and 1856. Marcus, would you tell us about who used the swamp first? If we go by the archaeological record, it's Native Americans. I suspect, and so I write in City of Refuge, that it's a combination of Algonquian-speaking, Powhatan-aligned Native American groups on the one hand toward the northern end of the swamp, and perhaps Tuscaroran aligned Native Americans along the southeastern edge of the swamp and the western edge of the swamp. And then there's also contexts for ethnogenesis in which, for example, the Nansiman Native American cultures of the South Side of Virginia actually take shape within this context of change in the 18th century. But from some scholars argue as early as the late 17th century, I look to evidence a bit later in the early 18th century. From about the early 18th century, there's clear evidence that Black people, enslaved people of African descent, and perhaps free people to some degree of African descent too, depending upon which sector of the swamp you're looking at, begin engaging its landscape for a number of reasons to include resisting or flight, but also to include carving out a space to live. And this is particularly the example of the south side of the swamp, near Gates County, North Carolina, and other places, as historian Warren Miltier has mentioned in his work. It's not until the late 1720s at the earliest that there's significant interest among state actors 
in the Great Dismal Swamp. There's a lot of activity going back and forth crossing the swamp. Before then, there are Anglican ministers, for example, or travelers who traverse the region. But it's not until William Byrd II actually leads a surveying party through the swamp in the attempt to delineate the border between Virginia and North Carolina in 1728 that the first mention of the swamp as a potential site for land speculation or for plantation development is entered into the extant primary record. Byrd and others do not attempt on a grand scale to engage in what he suggested, which was essentially a hemp-producing plantation enterprise. That would wait another several decades into the early 1760s or late 1750s, when in the late 1750s, a number of outfits on the southern end of the swamp in the McKnight family began taking interest in the southern end of the swamp, and when in the early 1760s, the men of George Washington's generation, including George Washington himself, become interested in speculating in swamplands and ultimately in the attempt to establish a hemp and rice plantation in a sector of the swamp near what is today Suffolk. So it does seem that by the mid-18th century, there's a lot of interest in the Great Dismal Swamp. You have enslaved people looking at the swamp as a place to find freedom, landowners looking at the swamp as a place to find lucrative speculative ventures. But first, Marcus, would you tell us about maroons and Marinage? I see Marinage as the most pervasive form of enslaved people's resistance throughout the history of the Atlantic world, put very simply. At its base, it is slave flight. And over time, the establishment of communities or at least of groups that remain in flight indefinitely. In cases where treaties secure maroon spaces, You see the development of maroon communities that to this day remain preserved and maintained by maroon descendants. Maroons themselves, I see as enslaved people who consciously make the choice to escape, never to return, or at least never to be re enslaved in the same way that they escaped. And I have to qualify it that way because it's sort of unclear in the record, frankly. The scholarship of the Caribbean, for example, has examples of clear maroon spaces, of clear development of maroon communities, and of clear change over time in those spaces and those communities. But we don't have evidence of that in places like the Great Dismal Swamp. What we do have evidence of instead are the hundreds, likely, of enslaved people who slip into the swamp for an indefinite amount of time, who may return who may never return, who may escape elsewhere, but they're always on the move. And they're engaged in a form of slave resistance or slave flight also that's quite different than the effort to go visit family on another plantation within a slave zone, for example. And I demonstrate this in part by investigating archival silence or silences in the record where it's clear that this movement is taking shape. But we don't have the firsthand records as penned by Maroons themselves to describe this, to give this language to it. But I also describe it by using, for example, an essay by Edmund Jackson, who in 1852, writing for an audience in Boston, describes the Great Dismal Swamp as a city of refuge in the midst of slavery populated by Virginia Maroons. And his first example for his readers is to draw an analogy between maroon spaces in Cuba, Jamaica, and Santo Domingo and the Great Dismal Swamps, particular geography and environment for that form of slave resistance. Now, one of the big points that Marcus makes in his book, City of Refuge, is that the Great Dismal Swamp supported a form of marinage called petite marinage, rather than the grand or great form of marinage. Marcus, would you tell us about these different forms of marinage and why we don't tend to see grand marinage in mainland North America? There's a number of factors to consider, but first I'll begin with the actual root of the grand petite marinage binary as a scholarly framing. It traces to a scholar named Gabriel Debian, who in the mid-1960s was seeking a framework that could help scholars to understand different zones of marinage throughout the Caribbean. In places like Jamaica or Cuba, for example, especially Jamaica in the 18th century, 
and Cuba in the 19th century, where the relative population of people of African descent who were enslaved was significantly higher than the local colonial population in Jamaica, for example, by about the early months of the American Revolution. The island of Jamaica was home to about 200,000 enslaved people of African descent and about 18,000 people from the British Isles. Larger groups of enslaved people could coalesce in zones of Jamaica, for example, that were much more difficult for a smaller colonial population to access. And in this context, larger communities with more of the traditional markers of community could coalesce over time. This was the case in Jamaica in the early 18th century, that after the first Maroon War, which was a series of skirmishes on either end of the island, by about 1739-1740, a treaty is agreed between colonial forces and the Maroons in the mountains, which protected the mountainous communities from further molestation at the hands of colonial military engagement in exchange for certain agreements, such as not permitting any more enslaved people to enter a Maroon community. This wasn't the case in North America. In most parts of North America, we can think about the Low Country, for example, where enslaved proportions of the population in the Low Country parishes was high, very high, comparable to Jamaica, for example. And the geography similar in that there were swamps along the Savannah River corridor, especially, that were difficult to navigate and that were home to smaller maroon groups. But the overall population of enslaved people in these regions, on the one hand, remained much smaller, and on the other hand, especially in the 18th century, much more dispersed. This is particularly the case for Southside Virginia, the populations of the Southside Virginia counties, of course, proportionally high in terms of enslaved people, but in terms of real numbers by comparison to other parts of the Atlantic world, much smaller. The exceptions to this framing are two. One is the lower Mississippi River Valley region, where to the south of New Orleans especially, maroon communities did come into existence in the early 19th century and numbered several hundred. The most famous example, perhaps, is St. Malo's maroon communities, which are dislodged by an effort of Spanish officials to root out marinage in the region. In the other context, which is significantly worthy of note, is the Florida panhandle and the main peninsula of Florida as well, where movements of enslaved people into that region, as a number of scholars have traced, ultimately coalesced with local Native American communities to create by processes of ethnogenesis seminal communities in the early 19th century. And one scholar, for example, sees this process in the early part of the 19th century as perhaps the best example of Guam marinage in North America, although I sort of hesitate a bit at that because I'm thinking about instances like Jamaica, like Cuba, like the northern coast of South America, like the eastern parishes of Brazil, where the context for marinage was much different. But it is interesting that most of your case study about marinage takes place in Virginia, which had the largest enslaved population from the colonial period through the Civil War, didn't it? Absolutely. But the colonial context is quite different in Virginia for ways that I describe in City of Refuge, but in ways that I'm also still thinking about too. And so as I describe in City of Refuge, there's no evidence of an effort to establish a treaty with the maroon groups in the Great Dismal Swamp or with maroon groups much smaller, of course, in other parts of Virginia, such as the mountainous zones of the West. And in part, this is explained, I think, because of the Great Dismal Swamp's peculiar history of slavery as well. That's part of the reason why the subtitle of City of Refuge is Slavery and Petit Marinage. They coexist in the Great Dismal Swamp in ways that are not the case in other zones where marinage unfolds. And I think that part of this is because the Virginia South Side, and for that matter, Northeastern North Carolina, although the proportion of enslaved people in these regions remains high, the context of slavery is different. The mortality rates, for example, especially in the era of the American Revolution and going forward, are much, much smaller than points to the South in the tropical and subtropical zones 
of the Atlantic world, the Western Atlantic world, as I like to call it. And over time, the expansion of land companies or canal companies into the Dismal Swamp too, there's a higher proportion of enslaved people that are proximate to small maroon communities that develop in the Great Dismal Swamp than happens elsewhere. The mountainous zones of Jamaica, for example, are several days march inland. And part of that march is the fact that you have to elevate several thousand feet into the mountains by easily defendable passes in order to access these communities versus the Great Dismal Swamp, which in and of itself is a contained environment that is difficult to access because of its environment, because of its ecology, but its topography, the peaty soils aside, is different. What about the enslaved people who made their way into the swamp and built homes within it? Could you tell us a bit more about their life in the Great Dismal Swamp? The swamp offered refuge in many cases for those who were brave enough and determined enough, frankly, to hack into its outer pale of trees, I guess is the best way to describe it, and to seek paths to interior spots of the swamp, which were above the elevation of the water table. I should have mentioned this earlier, I suppose, but one of the distinctive features of the Great Dismal Swamp's landscape is that in certain interior sections of the swamp, there are islands, is a good way to describe them, or in the local way of describing them, hummocks, which rise to about 10 feet above the water table, the general water table throughout the swamp. And so while someone might have to trudge through three quarters of a mile of bog soils and hack through vines, depending upon the time of the year that they're traversing the swamp, they might be able to find an interior island within the swamp where they might be able to set up a camp and at least live in a form of relative freedom away from, for example, plantation labor or away from physical violence in a slave society. And so it's interesting to think about how the Dismal Swamp's landscape comes to be known in these ways. Of course, Native Americans traveling through the swamp is one form of evidence, but by the late 17th century and early 18th century, European travelers or colonial travelers are also crossing the swamp. They are using Native American footpaths in most cases. And so essentially, access to the swamp becomes common local knowledge. So the enslaved people who would seek refuge within the swamp, in my view at least, are enslaved people who are very much aware of the difficulties of living in this landscape, but also very much driven by the prospect of claiming ownership of their own bodies or claiming ownership of their ability to live without the fear of being punished physically or punished psychologically in plantation or slave society context. I'm curious about these hummocks or these islands within the swamp. Were these hummocks big enough for all the enslaved people who were seeking the swamp's freedom? Were these hummocks big enough that these enslaved people could form communities or build neighborhoods on? Yes. The largest of these hummocks averaged about 30 or so acres, give or take which was comparable to a small neighborhood in a place like Norfolk, for example. The communities, however, would be significantly different than what we would normally think about a colonial communal context, in part because these communities had to be highly mobile. They had to be ready at a moment's notice of being found or being betrayed to move, to pick up whatever they had established in whatever context they had found and move to another hummock several miles to the northeast, south, or west, depending upon which sector of the swamp they were in. And this, for what it's worth, was largely an 18th century context in the way that I frame it in City of Refuge. After about 1815, and especially after the mid-1820s, the swamp itself becomes a major site of extractive economy and swamp natural resources that see the expansion of company and slave labor-driven enterprises, small and large, which increasingly claim space in the eastern, northern, and southeastern sectors of the swamp, such that 
There's a small sliver of the swamp on the western fringe, which largely remains remote. And so in this context, I hesitate to define community in its most traditional sense. And I think of community more as small bands of enslaved people who come together. They may be small family units in some cases, but in most cases, they're likely smaller groups of twos and threes who may come together at one site to exist for several weeks or several months at a time before disbanding and moving about. So this wasn't a place where we'd find permanent buildings or structures per se, but we might find dwellings that look more like tents or something that could easily be packed up when someone needed to run. Exactly. Although there are other scholars who would argue to the contrary, which is part of the fun, I guess, in writing City of Refuge and thinking that through. Now, in addition to being a place where enslaved people could achieve more freedom, the Great Dismal Swamp was also a site of great resistance to slavery. Marcus, would you provide us with an overview of the many different slave uprisings and rebellions that took place in Virginia and the role that the Great Dismal Swamp played in those uprisings and rebellions? So the earliest grand scale rebellion in the region traced to 1730 was the Chesapeake Rebellion, during which several hundred Congolese Christians rise in revolt in Southside Virginia, Princess Anne County, and that region. And instead of laying claim to or otherwise taking control of the plantation environment they're in, they escape into the Dismal Swamp, where they seem to disappear from the record, except for the warnings to travelers in this time frame to JFD Smythe, for example, to beware when you travel through the swamp because of the marauders within it who might rob you, who might hurt you, who might maim you. And so I see the Chesapeake Rebellion and the several hundred Congolese Christians who take part in that rebellion, some of whom escape into the swamp, as really the first watershed moment of the Dismal's history of a place of resistance and a place of refuge for those who rose in rebellion. There's evidence throughout the 18th century of smaller instances where a few enslaved people might resist by running into the swamp. But it's not really, again, until the American Revolutionary era, and particularly Lord Dunmore's retreat from Williamsburg down into Southside Virginia, that we see a moment where there's a second significant population of enslaved people, or formerly enslaved people, who seek refuge within the northern sector of the swamp. And in that case, when Dunmore eventually began to retreat up the Chesapeake Bay before ultimately retreating from the Chesapeake region altogether, a number of they who he mustered in the Ethiopian regiment, as he called it, chose not to ride up the Chesapeake Bay toward Maryland with him, but chose instead to remain in Southside Virginia and to seek refuge in the Dismal Swamp when they deserted the Ethiopian regiment. There are several other instances during Gabriel Prosser or Gabriel's conspiracy in Richmond in 1800. There's significant speculation that enslaved people are easily moving about the Dismal Swamp. Two years later, during the Eastern Conspiracy, there's definite evidence of enslaved people moving about the swamp, using its waterways as highways for information to organize enslaved people, theoretically or potentially, in Southside Virginia counties and Northeastern North Carolina counties. And then the last major watershed, at least as I cover in City of Refuge, is during the weeks after the initial uprising in Southampton County, known as Nat Turner's Rebellion, when for several weeks in September and October, the wide speculation was that Nat Turner himself, as well as several others who had risen in revolt during the rebellion, had taken refuge in the Great Dismal Swamp, which even today is at least 40 or more miles from Southampton County. But these reports circulated widely, appearing in papers in places like Baltimore, for example, that those who lived or labored about the Great Dismal Swamp region need be on the lookout for Nat Turner. He's hiding in the swamp. Except for, of course, we know that he wasn't. He hadn't <laughs> gone more than a mile and a half from the plantation that he was born on and that he labored on. And he was found, of course, six weeks after the rebellion, hiding under a pile of fence rails. But in this context, too, 
the Dismal Swamp always loomed as sort of this great landscape of protection for those who chose to rise in revolt, especially enslaved people, against Virginia and North Carolina's plantation societies. And indeed, this sort of ethos of fear, Harriet Beecher Stowe captured in her novel Dread, A Tale of the Dismal Swamp, which was serialized in 1856. Yeah, it definitely sounds like depending on who you are, the swamp was either a great place of empowerment and freedom or a place to be really feared and dreaded. I would agree. Earlier, you mentioned that there were corporate entities that went into the swamp in order to try and profit from it. And after we take a moment to talk about our episode sponsor, I wonder if you would tell us about the development of the Dismal Swamp Company and later the Dismal Swamp Canal Company. Although it carries Dismal in its name, I think Marcus is making an interesting case for why the Great Dismal Swamp is such a fascinating and wonderful place to study and research early America. Now, if I may, the holiday season is upon us, and I'd like to call your attention to a few holiday season reminders. First, as I mentioned at the start of this podcast, our December episodes will post on Tuesday, December 8, and Tuesday, December 15, 2020. We're publishing our second December episode a week early, both so you can enjoy the Massachusetts 1620 series and so our digital audio team and I can enjoy a couple of weeks off to spend with our families. Ben Franklin's World will be back with new episodes on Tuesday, January 5, 2021. Second, if you're looking for thoughtful gifts this year and for a way to support your favorite podcast, please consider gifting your friends and family a gift subscription to Ben Franklin's World. You can purchase a gift subscription at benfranklinsworld.com slash subscribe. From there, just click the Give as a Gift option right below the Join button. Gift subscriptions receive the same benefits as our regular subscriptions, and that includes ad-free versions of each new episode and monthly bonus episodes. Plus, your gift subscription will help us continue our work to bring well-researched history right to your ears. Again, you can purchase a gift subscription at benfranklinsworld.com slash subscribe. Now lastly, and most importantly, Thank you for all of your support this year, and happy holidays! I hope you and your loved ones enjoy a safe, happy, and fun holiday season. All right, let's get back to Marcus and the Great Dismal Swamp. Marcus, in what ways did the Dismal Swamp Company and the later Dismal Swamp Canal Company seek to make a profit from the swamp and the Maroons who lived within it? So the Dismal Swamp Company is perhaps the most prominent of the companies, the early companies in the Dismal Swamp region. It's incorporated in 1763. And almost immediately after its incorporation, George Washington leads several others into the Dismal Swamp's northern sector in order to survey formally the 40,000 acre land tract that the company sought to enter into local county courts in order to protect. They're doing this in part because there are also smaller outfits in the same time period who are attempting to survey the southwestern sector of the swamp and the southeastern sector of the swamp across the North Carolina state line, such that at least in the original conception of the Dismal Swamp Company's 11 or 12 member board, the 40,000 acre tract might be held until it appreciated and then sold at a profit. That was the initial plan of the Dismal Swamp Company. In the meantime, in holding these lands, the company would establish at least one zone that would become a hemp and or rice producing plantation. This zone they established near what becomes Suffolk in the 1760s. They name it Dismal Town and they name the plantation Dismal Plantation. It's located about six miles or so to the south southeast of what is today Suffolk. The plan is initially for company members to raise a group of enslaved laborers who they would in turn dispatch to Dismal Plantation to undertake the labors of clearing land, of cutting ditches, of planting hemp, planting rice, of harvesting hemp, harvesting rice, and of maintaining the irrigation ditches such that this enterprise might ultimately become profitable even as the company itself has a grander scheme of awaiting the ability to sell the lands at a profit. And they're awaiting the ability to sell the lands at a profit in part because there's activity on the southern end of the swamp. People are interested in attempting at least 
to change the landscape through the exploitation of slave labor such that it might become profitable plantation landscape. The Dismal Swamp Company's initial iteration extends to about 1814 before it's reincorporated as the Dismal Swamp Land Company. And in this time period, the American Revolution, of course, intervenes. George Washington, it goes without saying, takes a major role in the American Revolution, but also his brother, who was the first overseer of Dismal Plantation, John Augustine Washington, is drawn into a leadership role mustering committees of safety in Westmoreland County in Northern Virginia. What's left at Dismal Plantation are a succession of overseers and the same enslaved group, which fluctuates in number over time. A year after the initial group of all men is sent out, the members dispatch a number of women and two children to Dismal Plantation. And ultimately, the hemp and rice enterprise fails miserably, as can be read in company overseer correspondence, because the enslaved people simply refuse time and again to maintain the dishes or to properly cultivate hemp and rice. And not to mention, the swamp itself is not the best landscape for rice, albeit hemp could likely have been successful were the enslaved people able to be fully exploited. So the company also explores the option of contracting with white laborers who they would draw from Holland for their expertise in maintaining ditches. But this idea goes nowhere. And by about the mid-1780s, a number of the original members of the Dismal Swamp Company are aging and divesting of their shares, or at least direct oversight of the company's affairs. And this happens at about the same time that the company begins to engage in the extractive economy of timber which it becomes famous for in the 19th century. And enslaved people, of course, are at the center of that 19th century story of extracting timber from the swamp. It sounds like this was another place where the swamp really allowed enslaved people to resist slavery. You know, if they didn't want to oversee rice and hemp ditches or the drainage, they just didn't do the work. And so they're not doing the work really forced the Dismal Swamp Company to move into the timber business. Indeed. And then they also resisted that, <laughs> as I tell in City of Refuge. Now, Amanda wonders why you chose to end your book in 1856. So could you tell us about the periodization of your book, City of Refuge, and what happened to those who worked and lived in the swamp between 1856 and the end of slavery in 1865? Absolutely. First, allow me to compliment Amando's question. It's an excellent question. The most direct answer is that historians need to make decisions <laughs> about how they contextualize a story such that the sources are manageable in the way that they're framing the story, right? And so I chose 1856 because it's really a watershed moment at which the observers, many of whom were abolitionists or becoming increasingly radical as abolitionists, are turning to the Great Dismal Swamp as an example, the prime example in some of their conceptions, of slavery's long persistence in Virginia. There's this broader antebellum thrust among planters in Virginia to sort of describe Virginia as the Old South, the place where slavery used to be what we do, but we're moving ever so gently and progressively to a form of slavery that is benign, a form of slavery that is beneficial to enslaved people, a form of slavery that will ultimately die out over time, right? This is the last gasp of the Jeffersonian generation, essentially framing Virginia as on the avant-garde of slavery's demise, albeit at an undetermined future date. They pointed to, in often cases, the Deep South, the Cotton Belt, and the expansion into the South and West as the new frontier for slavery. Look, that's where slavery is really terrible now. That's not who we are. Except for Frederick Douglass and Edmund Jackson and Harry Beecher Stowe and others would point to the example of the Great Dismal Swamp and the example of plantations that were still in existence in Virginia and say slavery still exists here. And so I thought that a good place to really bring 
city of refuge to an end in a non-traditional way, because most traditional histories, of course, as I think Amando's question implies, look to the Civil War as the moment of freedom, as the moment that slavery ends. They look to 1863, for example, the Emancipation Proclamation as the moment that freedom comes. And so to the thrust of your actual question, that's essentially what happens in the last several years of the 1850s and in the opening years of 1863. Slavery persists in the Great Dismal Swamp, and it becomes increasingly standardized as the records of the Dismal Swamp Land Company and other companies shows. And slave laborers are still dispatched to slave labor sites. They're still extracting timber and other natural resources in the swamp. And those who choose to resist that context of slavery are still slipping to remote sectors of the swamp where they can engage in petite marinage for time undetermined. This comes to an end most likely in the years after the Emancipation Proclamation, especially the years after the end of slavery and the circulation of the 13th Amendment, which brings a federally mandated end to slavery in 1865. And most traditional stories take that as the end of the story of slavery and petite marinage in the Great Dismal Swamp in a very traditional way as we imagine the last Maroons emerging from the swamp in the late 1860s and the early 1870s. For me to do that in City of Refuge would have required really wrangling with another 10 or more years of company records. And that wasn't my original idea for City of Refuge. And my editors <laughs> certainly would have pressed against me going further that way, too. Throughout our conversation, we've discussed how slavery and resistance to enslavement fit within the context of the Great Dismal Swamp and how the context of the swamp is different and perhaps unique from other studies of plantation or urban slavery. Marcus, what do you think more unique studies like yours adds to our understanding of slavery and its practice and development in early America? Sure. I think City of Refuge reminds us that slavery was messy. I think we often get an idea from traditional plantation studies. I think we get a sense that slavery happened in circumstances that were relatively predictable We even engage in the story of slave resistance in that context, in a plantation context, as relatively predictable. The pressures of oppression in such a context, for example, lead to flashpoints where enslaved people are punished and then they resist, or particular circumstances where overseers are particularly vigorous in the ways in which they punish enslaved people, and that leads to resistance, so on and so forth. We tend to look at slavery in urban contexts as sort of the foil for the plantation context, where we can see the very blurred lines between slavery and freedom for enslaved people in urban contexts who work as domestics, labored as domestics, who were oppressed in homes and subject to sexual and physical violence and the like. The records of the Great Dismal Swamp and the story of the swamp itself does remind us that even in this remote corner of Virginia, all of this was true. The enslaved people in the Great Dismal Swamp, for example, were pushed in extreme environmental contexts to labor under conditions that were certainly inhumane. But it's also this space where enslaved people could slip away from that and imagine their own version of freedom without the watchful eye of local town watch officials, slave hunters and the like, regularly interrupting their intercourse. And so I really think that City of Refuge, even the title itself, is sort of a reminder that cities in the 18th and 19th century context especially are not as we think about them today. And even as we think about them in those contexts, they could vary widely, especially if you think about this context for Marinage. Let's dive into the time warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. 
Marcus, in your opinion, what might have happened if the Dismal Swamp and Dismal Swamp Canal companies had not existed? How would the lack of the timber and portage economies in the Great Dismal Swamp have impacted the ability of enslaved people to make their way to and to live in the Great Dismal Swamp? I mentioned this in City of Refuge. I think the Great Dismal Swamp ultimately becomes a place where a grand version of Marinage might exist. Without the canal and timber companies, the Great Dismal Swamp remains a much larger landscape, a much more unaltered landscape. Before about the antebellum period, the Great Dismal Swamp covered about 2,000 square miles. It's about the size of the state of Delaware. It's at a minimum 25 miles north to south, depending upon how you draw that line, and a little bit less east to west. It's essentially a great landscape into which enslaved people might go and coalesce in large enough numbers to defend the space without the intrusion of slavery in the form of slave labor camps and without that proximity of at least that form of slave society. Now, many would push back against that and say, well, how do they survive in this context then? How is it possible to build the sort of space for community without access, one might imagine, to finished goods or manufactured goods or food even? And to that, I would respond that there were very much highly active and vigorous internal economies that also might have progressed to such a degree that the Great Dismal Swamp essentially had the real potential to look more like a maroon colony or landscape as developed in Jamaica than it ultimately became. Marcus, do you have a new research project in the works? Is there an aspect of history that you're researching and writing about now? So I'm actually taking a much closer look at the records of Dismal Plantation, at least in my earliest new research. I'm very interested in a story of revolutionary continuity, as it can be told in the enslaved people's experience, to the best of the ability to do so, of course, at Dismal Plantation. Dismal Plantation, at least as I was able to understand in City of Refuge, lasted about 30 or more years. And I'm still sort of trying to define the end point, but at least in the City of Refuge, I close it in the 1790s. And the initial group of enslaved people who are sent to Dismal Plantation in the 1760s, it seems are at least still there in 1775 and potentially in 1785. There's some attrition in the 80s. And so I'm really interested in what their story of slavery can tell us about what we consider when we think about the American Revolution more broadly. And I'm thinking about the way in which recently Michael McDonnell or Woody Holton have written about Virginia's American revolutionary story. But I'm also thinking about the way in which Lorena Walsh or Mary Thompson have talked about Carter's Grove or Mount Vernon as plantation landscapes and landscapes where enslaved communities did exist as well. And so that's where I really stand right now. I'm really excited about the potential of learning more about the 54 enslaved people who were at Dismal Plantation, we know for sure, according to the records in the 1760s. What if we have more questions about the Great Dismal Swamp and the enslaved people who use the swamp? Where's the best place we can contact you? Sure. I am at the University of Rhode Island in the Department of History. My email is m. P. Nevius, N E V I U S, all one word, at uri.edu. And I'm also on Twitter and on Instagram and on Facebook, on Twitter at Mark Neve, M A R C N E E V, on Instagram as Marcus P. Nevius, and on Facebook as well as Marcus P. Nevius. Your best bet is to email me. Marcus Nevius, thank you for taking us through the Great Dismal Swamp and its history as a place that inspired slave resistance. Liz, I appreciate the opportunity and the invitation to have this conversation. I really, really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Marcus's study of slavery in the Great Dismal Swamp is unusual. As Marcus noted, most traditional studies of slavery would have us investigating the conditions of servitude, the labor enslaved people undertook, and the ways in which enslaved people resisted their enslavement in settings of large tobacco, cotton, or rice plantations, or in an urban area. But Marcus's study, City of Refuge, takes us into the Great Dismal Swamp 
to investigate these experiences and conditions. And what we can see is that slavery was messy, especially within an environment that had dense vegetation, soft and deep peaty soils, and was prone to flooding. But it's within this physically messy setting that we can also see just how unpredictable slavery really was. Yes, the enslaved who lived and worked in the swamp were pushed by the dismal swamp land and canal companies to work in harsh conditions. But the swamp was also a place where unpredictable resistance occurred. For example, the enslaved might work on building irrigation and drainage ditches on the dismal plantation, only to stop working one day because they didn't want to maintain those ditches. They might also be hard at work harvesting cypress trees, but then decide to abscond into the interior of the swamp where they might find a hummock to camp out on in a version of slave flight known as petite marinage. Additionally, life for the enslaved who lived in the swamp was also unpredictable. As Marcus noted, we might find communities that were composed of two or three enslaved individuals residing on a hummock, but we wouldn't have found the great maroon communities that we would have found in Jamaica, Cuba, or in Florida. We also wouldn't have found permanent towns of maroons in the Great Dismal Swamp. Instead, we'd find groups of twos and threes who might live for weeks on the same hummock and then find that those groups of twos and threes had to run away as quickly as possible as enslavers entered the swamp to find their runaway laborers. Studying slavery through the lens of the Great Dismal Swamp gives us a different window through which to view early America's practice of slavery. It allows us to see how practices like marinage, which enslaved people practiced in the Caribbean, translated into places on the North American mainland. It also helps us to see that slavery didn't just exist on plantations or in urban centers. It existed in all sorts of environments, like mountain ranges or in swamps. In essence, Marcus's study of slavery helps us see just how pervasive the American practice of slavery really was. You can find more information about Marcus, his book, City of Refuge, plus notes and links for everything we talked about today on the show notes page. BenFranklinsWorld.com slash two, eight, nine. Please remember our programming note. Our December 2020 episodes will post on December 8 and December 15. Then Ben Franklin's World will take the rest of December off and will return with brand new episodes on Tuesday, January 5, 2021. Production assistance for this podcast comes from the Omahundro Institute's digital audio team. Joseph Edelman, Martha Howard, Holly White, Karen Wolf, and Peyton Young. Breakmaster Cylinder composed our custom theme music. Finally, have you heard or read of slavery being practiced in other non-traditional environments? I'm curious what you've come across, so please let me know. Liz at BenFranklinsWorld.com. Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omahundro Institute.